gone. Brilliant from Broad. Eight for 15, best bowling figures on this ground. Had to deliver, no Jimmy Anderson. And boy, did he deliver. Stuart, we're going to look back at probably your most iconic spell, the one that England fans remember the most, the eight for 15 at Trent Bridge. First of all, where would you rate that spell in everything that you've done in the game of cricket? It has to be number one. Just for being at Trent Bridge, my home ground, a, a ground that I grew up watching Dad on, a ground that feels very special to the family, the city I was born in, ashes on the line, felt extra nervous. Jimmy had injured himself the week before at Edgebaston, first time I'd ever bowled the first ball of a test match, so I'd put quite a bit of extra pressure on myself for that. So to go and deliver a spell that, well, regain the ashes in an hour, really, was very, very special. Throughout your career, you've spoken about the importance of Jimmy Anderson at the other end. What did it feel like that day without Jimmy at the other end? I was really nervous, uh, but Jimmy had made a point of staying around the group, actually. It was quite a nice, relaxed atmosphere leading into the game, but there's no doubt going to bed the night before, I'm thinking there is an added pressure on me here to set the tone, to lead the team, to lead the attack, you know, without one of my best mates who's done it so well for such a long period of time. I actually think you, that you might have, I think I saw you the morning of and it was a bit like, no, Jimmy, how are you feeling? And, that, and I was like, I'd been feeling it quite internal, but no one actually asked me, no, Jimmy, how are you feeling? And I, that was a bit like, oh, well, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's not here, but I feel, I feel, I feel nervous, but good. Um, but, there was quite a lot of conversation that morning, if, if you remember, because the stats are quite a big bat first at Trent Bridge. Oh, let me move on to that. <laughs> because being the local lad, I'm sure you would be the one that Alistair Cook goes up to straight away and says, Stuart, you know this ground the best. What would you do if you win the toss? And I'm sure you would have got it spot on at Trent Bridge. 100% bat. <laughs> they were my exact words. 100% bat. 100% bat. He said, you know, there's a bit more grass on it than usual. But there was 10 mil at Edgebaston and 8 mil, I think, at Trent Bridge. So there was actually more in the game before. It's nervous enough, let alone when you see a pitch like this that has got quite a bit of grass. It's got quite a bit of live grass as well, which is a bit different than last week. Last week had a lot of grass, but it was all dead and brown. But at the same time, there are a few cracks just starting to open up as well. The stats are actually quite strong for batting first. I think it was like 14 out of the last 15 test matches were won by the team batting first. So I was like, it's a risk. It's a risk, mate. I'm not sure about it. It's a bat first. I've played it a long time. It gets quicker day two, and that's when you nick it. That was my theory. But then I was marking my run-up out, and Shane Warne walked past me. He was just the biggest bat first ever, wasn't he? Because he wanted it to turn. He just sort of looked at me and smiled and laughed and went, cool, that's a bowl first if ever I've seen one. <laughs> I thought, God, am I getting this wrong? Because <laughs> Cookie was quite a, a, a big... Um, believe that it was a bowl first and he was a bit like that as he opened the batting there's an extra pressure to open the batting and he did like to lean towards bowling so I did walk up to him after I chatted to Warney and just said you know what Skip there's, the clouds are building a little bit it could be a bowl England have won the toss Alistair what are you going to do uh, we're going to have a bowl some people wanted to make you captain recently. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would have been a disaster. Um, so, Wait, uh, didn't you get a rain delay or something yeah. before that might have helped just spice it yeah, up a little yeah, bit? Yeah, and it did. Massively, yeah. We had five minutes. So it actually started at 11.05. It was five minutes of spring cool. I slipped a lot in my first couple of balls. And I remember, I think Bumble on the commentary said, look at the spike marks, see how much moisture's in the pitch. Stuart Broad has just roughed it up on that front line, just that he gets a grip with his spikes. And the darker that is, it's telling you there's a little bit of moisture under this surface. And I was running into bowl, actually, thinking about my feet not slipping rather than where the ball's going to go. It's actually quite regulation in a test match. You're trying to settle for that first over. And if you notice, when I got Chris Rogers out, caught first slip. Oh, beauty. Stuart Broad. First thing I do is look back because I was worried about the no ball because I felt like I was slipping loads. I fell over the line. But fortunately, I'd slipped over the line rather than landed over the line. So, uh, yeah, the rain delay, the five-minute sprinkle was a huge help, but it, it was a, I can now say it was a 100% bowl. Aussies with a lot of left-handers in their lineup. You're now round the wicket to the left-handers of Australia. Rogers, you've just mentioned. Why are you going round the wicket? 
I'd had a good go at going over the wicket to lefties, and my numbers hadn't really matched up. You know, I was averaging nearly 40, not quite 40, against the lefties in Test cricket over a decent period of time, probably 2000 and, you know, 2007, 8 to 15. So I had to do something different. You know, if you stand still as an international sports person, you, you're um, dead in the water, really. So I, I, I needed to flip that around. Otis Gibson and I came up with this theory that let's try round the wicket, but let's do it differently. Let's not do the traditional round the wicket and swing it back and play with the angles. Let's try and move it away from the left-handed batter, but from a really straight line, um, make it very difficult to cut the ball and to score through the leg side. So it took two or three months for me to feel comfortable doing that. But by the time Trent Bridge came around, it sort of bedded in. I'd had a bit of success at actually getting more LBWs than I thought I ever would from around the wicket. And it changed my career. Not, not necessarily that day, but just coming around the wicket to the lefties, because um, I think I've averaged something like 13, 14 since. Um, so the stats don't lie on that occasion, I think. The other stat that day was obviously Rogers was your 300th test wicket. 300. He's joined the big club. You're a stat geek, so you'd have known that. How important a milestone was that for you to do on your home ground? Uh, it was nice to get it early, to be honest. I, I'm not someone who gets particularly, you know, set on milestones. But when you're stuck on 299, uh, I actually had um, Neville caught down the leg side at Edgebaston. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't get given out. We had no reviews left, which would have been 300. Is the glove. Chris Gaffney shakes his head. I was beginning to think, oh God, like maybe it won't come. So to get it third ball was a great settler for me, to be honest. Uh, obviously, I had the nerves of bowling the first ball in the Test match for the first time. Home ground, it was buzzing. It was it, there was a lot of emotion there, and that that definitely definitely settled me, and it stopped my mind just thinking about nonsense. You know, if if it taken me 10, 15, 20 overs to get the 300th wicket, there'd be part of my brain going. Oh, I just can't get this 300th. Whereas to get it straight away, that's gone. That's out of the brain. Let's focus on adapting to these conditions. Can't believe people not walking in Ashes battles, to be honest. Awful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it quite get as much media scrutiny that one. <laughs> a big smile on his face. Why wouldn't you? What a club he's joined. Your next week, it's Steve Smith. Which yeah. plan are you on with Steve Smith now? You've got 100, get him out LB because he shuffles across. This time he sort of nicks one from fourth stump. What plan are you on in 2015 for Smith? It was the nick plan. Right. But it sort of only seems to work if the ball seems. And a nick from sort of slightly back of a length. I can't remember how many runs he got. I might have got six. So he clipped me through mid wicket, I think. And then he drilled me through cover point, like nailed me. But it was quite wide and I actually clapped because I immediately that told me he's not settled here that's not a Steve Smith second ball shot at all he's fidgety but he's normally mentally very calm so that sort of there was something not quite right with him um, and that's when I sort of I knew I had to try and make him play the next ball I didn't want to give him something that he could settle and leave whatever I did I had to make him play bit wider than I was hoping, but he just sort of nibbled at fifth stump and because there was a bit of zip in the pitch, carried easily to slip and weirdest scorecard ever, isn't it? Ten for two off one. You know, we, Are you we, worried about your run rate? Yeah, at that stage? Heck, yeah. <laughs> if someone had told me the night before you're gonna go for ten tomorrow first over, I'd be like, oh no. <laughs> but to get two was uh, you know, it was all action. And then of course Woody got Warner first ball. Which you've said is an was an important wicket, yeah, haven't you? The most, the yeah. most important of the day. Oh, there's another. What a start, Mark Wood this time. You know, to settle Woody, Warner on those sort of pitches is arguably his most dangerous. Quick scoring ground, is actually skidding on lovely. You can't bowl that sort of back a length to him, he cuts it and pulls it. I think there's some numbers on the amount of times we hit the stumps that day and it was tiny. He could have been really dangerous, but he just, yeah, inside nicked a, a ball and suddenly that's when the players started believing something could happen here. Ten for three is such an irregular scorecard, especially after seven balls. I'm going to run through your eight. It was obviously Rogers, Smith, Marsh, Voges, Clark, Stark, Johnson and Lyon. All eight caught 
in the slip cordon or behind the stumps. How important was the catching that day? Because it, towards the end of your career, they were shelling a few. That day, they were brilliant, that slip cordon. Oh, gone! Oh, he's broad again! Yeah, and I think Trevor Bayliss has to take a lot of credit for that. We did a camp before the Ashes series in um, Spain, and he said, don't bring bats, don't bring balls. We just did fielding. Fielding and fitness and cycling and he nicked the ball for hours. And we had a pretty settled slip cordon and the guys caught amazing all series. So that actually wasn't a surprise. It wasn't like out of the blue we caught really well at Trent Bridge. We'd been catching brilliantly all series and it's amazing when you put that mental focus on something, how quickly you can improve. And you know, Rooty, Belly, Cookie and Lydie and then Stokes, he took a mag uh, obviously a, mag a magical one. So we'd been brilliant all series. It wasn't surprising when they were sticking. Oh, what a catch! Ben Stokes! Wasn't a surprise, but the Stokes catch gave a surprise reaction from you. Where, where did that reaction come from? Obviously from the catch, but yeah, just the best. I, just the, the, obviously, I had almost the best seat in the house. I was so close to it. it the speed of it travelling. And you get a, an instinct straight away as a bowler. And as soon as Virgis, it was like a thick edge, I thought four. Just immediately, I was like, oh, that's four. That's just going to run away. He almost like dived at it like a football goalkeeper saving a penalty. And it stuck. And the surprise on his face is amazing. He looks like a little kid, doesn't he, when he gets up. But the speed of it happening and the agility he showed to take that catch, it's not a surprise to us. We've seen him do it on numerous occasions. but. To see it from, what was I at the end, 12 yards away was, was remarkable. The reaction from you was unbelievable. There was the other reaction that day that I noted watching back at some of the catches. There were some very odd thumbs-up yeah. celebrations going on with Rooty in the slip yeah. court. What, what was that all about? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I think, but I think there was um, maybe something in the in-betweeners that we were watching uh, that were like, they were doing that. And to be honest, if anyone asked me 20 seconds after taking a wicket, like, why did you do that? You can't, I, I don't know the emotion, I can't control the emotion that, that I get when I take a wicket. But yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've watched it back and seen that and I think, what are you doing? Tell us what it's like now in the middle. You're playing Australia on your home ground. You're on your way to 8 for 15. The crowd's erupting, they're catching it out of nowhere in the slip corner. What does it feel like in the middle of Trent Bridge? Honestly, I felt like the ground was shaking at times. Trent Bridge has got a unique atmosphere. It's, it's not the biggest ground in the UK, but it's, it can, along with Edgebaston, can get really loud. There was a moment when Michael Clark was batting um, and his footwork was slightly off. I think Woody had bowled a couple of bumpers. So I just did the, the oldest trick in the book of move fine leg five yards and try to bowl an away swinging fuller ball, but it ended up being a rank car folly wide and he managed to nick it, just throwing his hands at it, and Cookie took a really good catch. And gone. Another fine catch. I hadn't thought that that was my fifth wicket, because it was all happening so quick. I don't know how many overs I bowled, maybe three or four. But I remember the sort of clapping, and there was a couple of commentators on the, you know, the balcony outside the commentary box at Trent Bridge clapping, and I looked back to the scoreboard, and it said five wickets. I was like, wow. like. I didn't even realise. It all just happened so much. Wickets falling at both ends. That's when I thought, we're on to a good thing here. We, we've got Australia six down an hour or, or probably half an hour into play. But then the lot, I felt like the gap between the five and then getting Mitch felt like, I don't know how long it was, but it felt like an, an age. hour. I think there was an hour for those last four wickets yeah. or something. It, honestly, it felt like a session. It was still moving, still zipping around, but it had gone into a bit of play and miss mode. And um, we weren't leaking runs, but I just, I just couldn't find that edge. So when Mitch nicked it and Rudy took the catch. Damn, that's another. I think I actually remember feeling like, <sighs> finally, which sounds a ridiculous thing. I suddenly had six for 11 or something, but it, it really was a, it was a oh, finally moment. I've actually managed to make a breakthrough. It was weird because of the emotion of the, the pace everything was happening. All gone. Brilliant from Broad. Eight for 15, best bowling figures on this ground. Quite a remarkable morning. Stuart Broad had to deliver, no Jimmy Anderson, and boy, did he deliver.
how nice is it to do it at that venue in front of people, family and friends? Yeah, awesome. My mum's really superstitious. Um, she likes to call it routines, which is I, I get. So if we're not getting wickets, she'll go for a lap of the ground and all that sort of stuff. And uh, she went to get a coffee, and she could just see the pitch through the gap at Trent Bridge, and the first wicket went. And then we got two in the first over. So she decided she couldn't move from that spot because we were taking wickets. So she watched all eight from the coffee queue. I think she did get a coffee, but she, uh, <laughs> she watched all eight from the coffee queue. So bear in mind, she's got lovely seats in the newsstand, perfectly good. You know, people would pay a lot of money for those seats, but she's watching from the coffee queue behind the stand because she got superstitious that it was a lucky spot. And what did you feel like when you sat there, eight for 15, on your home ground? What, what was the, your the moment, actually, I, I made a cup of tea. And I sat down in my spot with a cup of tea, looked up when Cookie and Lively had gone out to bat, and I think Lively had a beautiful cover drive off Stark. And there's still 16 minutes or something to lunch, and we bowled them out, and we're batting. And I remember like sipping my tea going, OK, what has just happened there? You know, we've won the toss and bowled, and we're sat taking our boots off before lunch. That just doesn't make any sense. And I look back at it, obviously 8.15, which is incredible, and still doesn't really like, make sense when I look at the scoreboard. But without doubt, my favorite moment of the day was Rooty's 100. Cut away, cut away by Root to the fence. 100 for Joe Root. If we'd have then got bowled out for 70, it would have taken so much of the the oomph out of it, maybe, but seeing Rooty get an amazing 100 made it even more special because we'd gone and gone way past Australia and we finished that evening knowing we'd regain the Ashes, which is so rare after one day of a test match. So that's three times now that, you know, 09, you bowled them out Australia at the Oval, you win the Ashes. Durham, you bowl them out, you win the Ashes, and now Trent Bridge, you've done it again. How proud are you that you're producing spells that are not only winning games, but winning Ashes for England? Yeah, I, I, Ashes Cricket's had a huge influence in my um, love for cricket, my interest levels for cricket. I used to watch it religiously uh, on videotape and stuff, and there was just something really special about Ashes Cricket watching it as a kid, and the, the thought of, of playing it was a big driver for me. I, wanted to, I didn't want to just play for England. I remember getting my cap in Sri Lanka, and I never just wanted a test cap. My dream was to win games for England. My dream was to build memories with a test cap, win series. I always wanted to continuously improve. And um, I feel like I've been fortunate that I have improved and I have kept going and I have kept looking at ways that my game can go to another level. And um, the mental side of the game is the, the biggest thing that I've improved from probably 23, 24, creating this thing that I call warrior mode which has no doubt helped me settle in pressurised situations and helped me keep a clear head um, when I know that momentum needs shifting. And um, when I eventually finish, will probably define my career in the fact that I know that captains, Cookie will say it to me on the phone all the time, he knew that when the game was on the line, he'd come looking for me because he knew that I wanted, I wanted to, to give it a crack. Obviously, your most iconic Obviously, your most important, especially for England fans. Was it your best spell? No. <laughs> That's in it, the stumps. <laughs> <laughs> it's my most memorable for me, as we've mentioned, home crowd, ashes on the line, ashes cricket, amazing celebrations, remembering that Saturday afternoon where everyone was in party mode. Was it my best spell of bowling? No. Absolutely outstanding, Stuart Broad. Eight for 15 take a bow absolutely awesome quite remarkable cricketer he really is Stuart Broad when he's on song there is no one better he just delivers spells from nowhere and he has done for England this morning